Hi folks, I'm Bill McBurney and um, what we're here to do today is uh, examine some aspects of essential practicing with particular emphasis on playing with recordings. Um, as many of you know, I'm a, a jazz and Latin flute player from Canada and um, I, my real emphasis is on improvisation. That's what I really like to do. And I like to improvise in any context. Uh, admittedly, as a, as a professional musician, most of the calls are for um, more orthodox music, uh, which is to say, uh, in my case, bebop, swing, Latin, um, Brazilian, uh, a little bit of uh, funk, pop, R&B. But in any event, they're, they're pretty orthodox musical situations as opposed to entirely free formats which I've been exploring a little more recently. Um, and those are really, really a, a ton of fun. And uh, they present their own challenges, um, if you're serious about it, of course, and I am. Um, but we'll concentrate on more orthodox styles of music today. So, um, people are starting to come on board. I'll acknowledge people now and again, and uh, uh, I, I may not get to all of you, but uh, I'll say hello to Dorianne because she's there already. <laughs> um, the thing about improvising is that your ear is really, really important. Um, being able to hear things is the most critical thing. There's a lot of theory that you can study um, and learn about that will enable you to do tons of things when you're improvising. There's no um, uh, harm involved in learning theory but you can get a little preoccupied by it and a little overwhelmed by it and at the end of the day your ear is the most important thing and you will always be relying on that whether you're a beginner or an advanced player so it's the place to begin and the key in in improvising is to engage your ear and you must do that as soon as possible so what I'm going to do today is um, illustrate with a few tracks how I go about practicing and my practice sessions essentially consist of playing with whatever I'm listening to so in other words I'm constantly engaging my ear um, the other thing is it's really all I practice anymore and uh, it, it, strange enough I don't do any technical stuff I don't do any scales or arpeggios or etudes or long tones all of those things I have done those in the past of course um, but now my practice session consists of essentially everything you're going to hear today or at least the way I go about it um, for those of you who are more uh, inexperienced junior intermediate level players even getting into advanced stages I can't uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to follow my example about devoting 100% of your time to playing with recordings. You really have to focus on things like your technique, evenness of digital technique, your sound. Um, those things have to be cultivated. So a lot of your practice regimen is going to be dedicated to that as mine once was. Uh, so don't ignore those things and especially scales. Uh, especially scales. Um, so maybe we should just uh, get underway with something here. Um, I've picked three tracks and I'll see if I can get through them um, and we'll just I'll, I'll just demonstrate what I do when I'm practicing and maybe make a few comments at the end uh, make a few points. Let me round up my instrument here see if it's working. Whoops, sounds a little sharp and I'll, I'll be digressing from time to time so this is a good point. Flautists are often, uh, especially in non-classical idioms, um, they're a little out of control, <laughs> quite frankly, um, often because they're doublers um, or say they're classical players and they're nervous and uh, what happens, how this often um, reveals itself is sharpness in the pitch and especially in the third register. So one thing I'm going to recommend um, is First of all, when you get in the third register, really bear down to make sure you're not going sharp. And the other thing 
even before you start to play, is make sure you've got your head joint pulled out enough. I mean, it should be a good, most instruments have to be pulled out a good quarter of inch anyway. Um, and a final commentary, which is actually kind of important, is that sharpness is much more grating than being a little flat. Flat has a certain warmth to it, or the ear will tolerate it. So if you're going to err on either side, I would suggest just be a little flat, if anything. Um, okay, so let's take the first tune that I selected here, which is a blues-oriented thing by um, Al Lerman. And this is from his latest album entitled uh, Northern Bayou. Alan is an excellent blues artist. Um, and he has just two albums out, and they are both really good albums. So I'm just going to play one track here. I can't remember if it's really a blues or not. I'll find out as we're going along. Um, um, but the other thing I should mention about Alan, I, I happen to... Uh, cross paths with him because I'm sort of music in the ja moving in the jazz community and he's moving in the uh, blues community but we're both from the same hometown Port Colborne so we're a couple of hometown boys very small community that we grew up in so anyhow here is um, something by Al Lerman in fact it's the opening cut I think I picked yeah from uh, Northern Bayou and it's entitled Down to the River so let me just trigger it and let's see what happens. Okay, the first thing I'm going to say is it's in the key of A flat, and um, by and large, I'm probably going to be relying on a lot of pentatonics. Very simple structure um, in this, and I'm curious to find out if it's a, a legitimate 12 bar blues or just a blues oriented thing. We'll find out. So I'll just backtrack there and away we go. Start the track and see what happens. Down to the water, down to the water, 
ran into the second track there a little bit. Okay, so um, that was not a blues, by the way. Um, blues oriented, it moves to the four chord, uh, typical of a blues, but uh, it's not a 12 bar structure. Um, I was uh, sort of responding to what he was doing. A good trick is essentially to try and engage in a bit of a call and response. That's what I'm doing here. Um, so when he sings, try and give him some space and work yourself in between phrases. Um, I was extemporizing, so I was probably playing a lot more than I would have if I were actually recording with him. Um, but uh, uh, in general, uh, in this situation, there's, there's, there's room for you to maneuver. And it's a good idea, and it's a, a, a courtesy and a, a point of respect for the vocalist to let them be heard. And, and you just uh, find your place in between phrases. And sometimes just a few notes will work. You don't necessarily have to be playing a lot. Um, in this particular case, he had a bit of a chorus or a refrain or something. And um, at that point in the tune, I decided, okay, I'm actually going to play a little more continuously because that can help um, define the structure of the tune. And while you're improvising, it can, it can make you sound a little more like you know what you're doing. <laughs> so it was more or less a call and response for the, uh, the bulk of the tune. And then whenever you hit that uh, refrain-like interval, I would actually play more to distinguish that so it, it, it sounds uh, um, different because the tune is different at that point. The harmony's a little different. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things that I might tell you in that situation. I might find it in another track. I didn't hear it too much in this particular instance, but we're always inclined to be playing too much, quite frankly. And uh, sometimes choosing not to play strategically can be very effective. So for example, um, people are often wanting to define the, um, the, the beginning of a phrase. So play that note. But sometimes it's better to just back off and leave it alone and let the rhythm section do it. So bang, let the rhythm section do it. Don't you, don't you drop in there. So anyway, um, uh, a small point, but it's sort of an interesting stylistic point. Um, and it all is based on the principle of trying not to play too much, no one to stop. That's probably one of the um, trickiest things in music is <laughs> knowing when to stop. Okay, so um, let's see, I'll just see if I can acknowledge some more folks here. Uh, Yoav, hi there, and Jeff, William Karn. Oh. <laughs> He's not about to learn anything from me. <laughs> That's funny. And, oh, my soon-to-be son-in-law, Gregory. <laughs> it's given me not just two thumbs up, but three. Anyway, um, so that happened to be a blues in A-flat. And I was suggesting that you use the pentatonic a lot. Um, and maybe distinguish that refrain. Let me just play another uh, fragment of it. And um, I won't play the whole thing. Just uh, see if I can get some more ideas of what I might tell you. I'll just drop in the tune anyway. Notice he, he, he pulls back there. Just when I stop there, that's an example of people are sometimes inclined to engage in what are equivalent to run-on sentences. So knowing when to stop and actually letting the rhythm section carry it. And if you're not there, that has its own sense of, uh, has its own element of, of surprise, surprise and nuance. So it's just a way of thinking. Um, one of my fundamental philosophies is that often the best approach when you're improvising is not the process of addition, which is a very natural tendency for even me. I, I make the same mistake now and again. But 
people are thinking that, oh, I have to add something. I have to play, I have to play something, so I have to keep adding things. And actually, um, the process of improvisation involves uh, editing because you can't play everything you know all at once. So right away you're editing. And often, if you're confronted with a choice while you're on the fly, often the best choice to make is subtract, not to play, for example. Just do less, because that, in, that enables the band and the groove to sort of surface. And it also allows you sometimes to just reorient, reorient yourself and think about what you're going to do next. And it avoids the run-on sentence, nonsense, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, let's see if we can pick another tune now. Um, the second one I've picked here, or at least I've set up, um, this is by a really, really talented... By the way, these are all Canadians. And I deliberately picked uh, Canadian indie artists because I don't want to... Uh, use Ray Charles or, or Aretha Franklin, whom I practice with a lot, um, and whom you might know better. Uh, I don't want to run into cyberbots taking my live stream down. So I'm actually using this opportunity to celebrate some of our really, really good uh, Canadian indie artists. And you just heard the first one, Al Lerman, who's uh, a blues specialist. The next one, very talented woman, uh, Lila Bialy. Um, She's uh, quite well known in Canada. I think she's becoming better known uh, outside the country as well. Excellent writer, excellent player, great vocalist. Um, uh, she, the production values in her CDs are outstanding. Um, uh, um, she's uh, also a big booster of, of jazz and supporter of um, that idiom in our country. She's uh, the host of CBC's Saturday Night Jazz, for example. She's very pretty. <laughs> She's got a great husband, Ben Whitman, who plays the drums, and they have a, a little kid, Josh. And you can see that they're really like they're 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 into their family. I mean, it's it's really nice to behold. But anyway, I'm getting away from the music. So let's uh, find this track of Lila's now. This is from her latest album, and um, it's entitled "Out of Dust." That's the name of the album. The name of the track is. Let me see. The name of the track is Revival. So this is from Lila Bialy's latest CD, Out of the Dust, and it's entitled Revival. So let's see what's going to happen. I'll just have to play a few bars to see what's going on, um, where the groove is and that sort of thing. Come on This is going to be an even eights groove. The previous one was uh, kind of a shuffle, I guess. Um, so this is more even eights, more poppy, and uh, I can tell that it's in the key of G. So rest assured, I'm going to be using uh, probably a lot of the uh, 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 G pentatonic scale, uh, either major and or um, minor. And in the minor, I'll, I'll exploit the the blue note, which is the uh, flat five or the plus four, it's an extra note to the um, minor melodic scale. As I'm just going, like, your G major melodic scale is... Your minor mel melodic... Uh, or your minor... Um, uh, what scale am I talking about? Oh, pentatonic, yeah. Is... Uh, and if you just add that additional note, you end up with a blue scale. So a lot of my note choices, because this is in the key of G, and I'm hoping it's not too complex harmonically, a lot of my note choices are going to rest on just the G major pentatonic and probably more, the, which is... And the G minor, uh, actually, blues scale. So the long and the short of it is, I'm not going to be doing much that's terribly mysterious here from a melodic standpoint. I'm actually going to be working some basic uh, um, melodic constructs. So let's let's start this and see what happens. I'll just rewind it. Here we go. Come on now, we have to be louder. Come on down, 
Of course, I was playing far too much, by and large. There was a point later on in the tune where I backed off and did something that was a little more like I might do if I were actually dressing the track myself uh, with Lila. Um, but a lot of that is based on uh, the uh, um, the blue scale. Um, there were a few other changes in there that I may not entirely hit exactly but the thing is it's amazing how much you can do with very little first of all but even more interestingly with what you don't know i mean it's amazing how much you can do and not know exactly what you're doing so as long as you have the key area pinned and a, a basic source of melodic reference you can at least start so here i was saying that this is in the key of g and i was relying primarily on the uh, blues scale, but I also was introducing the, the, the natural third down again, because it sounds kind of hip, even though the thing is very bluesy. 
uh, just play a, a natural third. I put a little too many on the way out because I was sort of experimenting. The other thing I might say is um, I've just looked at one pentatonic, but I was actually playing some others, and I want you to recognize that um, these types of uh, um, harmonic and melodic situations can invite uh, very tedious uh, figures. Like, you don't want to hear somebody going... It's, it's boring pretty fast. It's correct, it, it fits, but... So the name of the game is to change your note order. So instead of, which is an obvious thing, you can do that, but watch this. Landing on the flat seven. It's, it's very neat, or somewhere else. The other thing is to find some other consonant pentatonics that work in that key area to get you off that um, bottom end of the chord structure. So for example, um, in this situation, I think probably uh, a, a, a minor pentatonic on the second will work. Let me see what else might work. A minor pentatonic on the fifth might work as well. So let me just go back. I'll force feed a couple of these into the track and just see how, how they function. Just bear with me a second. <coughs> She's on the bridge there, so the changes are... So she's back in G. Blue scale. Now I'll do it on F. Now I'll play a pentatonic on A. Let's try C minor pentatonic. So all I was doing there was I was trying to find pentatonics that might work. The um, the C didn't work so well because the thirteenth happened to be natural and it clashed a bit. So I just changed it to a minor, and that it enabled it melodically to fit in a little better. Uh, but those are the types of uh, uh, decisions that you end up making on the fly. It takes a while to get there. I admit it. You have to know all your scales. You have to know all your pentatonics. Um, but just a few elements will enable you to start to function. Maybe I'll just play a little more of this because I want you to note that situation where you're you're not necessarily catching every single phrase, demarking, uh, demarcating every phrase, and leaving a little space for the rhythm section to pull that off. Uh, means less work and it's it's groovier. So let's see. <laughs> I'm going to move past the bridge. Oops, I lost you guys for a second. But you see what I'm saying? It's a very subtle thing. And, like, your listener won't know what's happening. And the musicians might not know exactly what's happening, except it's like, hey, that was kind of groovy. What, what, what happened? And you know what I did? I subtracted. I didn't add. That simple. And you let the rhythm section, like, carry the, carry the weight. That, that, you know, they've got to, they've got to keep it happening, and you don't get in their way. Um, I might mention because this is a, sort of a funkier track. Uh, the things to practice with. I practice with everything I listen to. In a sense, I don't listen to music. I just practice with it. I play with it immediately. Um, the the best artists to listen to are vocalists, and uh, and typically R and B uh, or soul singers are best. Uh, so that means Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Etta James, and James Brown. Let me do that again. Write them down if you have to. So, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Etta James, 
and James Brown. They are very simple melodically. Often they're just playing blue notes or, or, or working off a, a, um, a blue scale grid. But the way they order their note choices, it's masterful. Plus the inflection, trying to get the flute to sound like that. So actually when you're playing with recordings initially, you're not going to be able to improvise right away. The way to cultivate your improvisatory ability is simply to match exactly what you're hearing as closely as you can. And don't worry about making mistakes because you make lots and it'll be horrible at first. I've been there. I know exactly what it feels like. You will get better. But the main thing is to try and match the way they sing. Get the flute to speak in the same way because you're going to have to look at it very differently from, from a classical perspective. Try and match, and even if you can't match it exactly and you, and you hit wrong notes, see if you can get the shape of the line, see if you can get a bit of the, the nuance and uh, um, uh, the color and, and concentrate on that. If you, if you start to capture that much, then you're away to the races. Now, the other thing I might say is that uh, um, learning to improvise by practicing with records may seem a little contradictory. Like, how can you learn to improvise if you're going to play with record, records and, and just imitate what you hear? On top of which, they're not playing with you, so there's no interaction. How can that help me get better as an improviser? Well, the key thing is you're engaging your ear. That's the first thing. And the idea is for you to respond to what you're hearing. Because in any real music situation, that is half the battle. Admittedly, when you're in a band, hopefully they're interacting with you. So they're listening to you and you're listening to them and you're both sort of playing off of each other. But you don't often have the luxury of jamming with a, a group or playing live. So when you're practicing, and you're practicing with recordings and thinking that, oh, maybe this is not going to help me, it's not true. Because once you get your ear happening and you become responsive to the music, then that is half the battle for when you're actually playing. The other thing I might suggest here is that often people uh, feel that they play better. <laughs> I hear this often enough as a teacher. Oh, it was so much better when I practiced it. And I think there's a little, a little bit of anxiety and tension that's, uh, that comes, uh, that happens when you're playing for somebody or a group. And being nervous is understandable. Everyone wants to be liked. <laughs> and you don't want to be disliked because you didn't perform very well. Well, uh, you have to sort of get over that and recognize that any measure of anxiety or nervousness is not serving you at all. So that's the first thing. It's not helping. So you've got to try and set it aside. Then you have to establish a, a mindset that will enable you to play. And in many cases, I do this myself from time to time when I catch myself getting nervous. Say, well, what am I doing? I'm just practicing. Because this is the way I practice. So if I'm practicing, then I don't feel quite so anxious or concerned about the the listener or preoccupied with how they're perceiving me. I want them to understand and get what I'm saying and I want to connect with them and I want to make them feel better but in terms of handling my own anxiety or nervousness it's more productive for me to say oh I'm just practicing. I know Don Thompson a uh, great uh, piano player, uh, vibus, drummer, uh, he's, a, he's a Canadian icon but I remember he addressed that point for somebody once, and he says, oh, I just pretend that I'm, I'm playing for my friends. Why, why should I be nervous? I want to make them happy. I'm just, I'm just, so at a big stadium, he, plays, he played many years with George Shearing, for example. <laughs> He's done some heavy gigs. Um, but, uh, you know, a big stadium, big audience or what have you. He's just, I'm just playing for my friends. Good attitude when you're... Uh, when you're inclined to be nervous. Okay, um, let me maybe set up the last track here. Um, the last one is, is going to be a, uh, a, a Brazilian 
piece. And this is by another Canadian, although he was born and raised in Brazil. But Canada has been very fortunate to have him uh, with us for the past few decades. He lives on the west coast of Canada. His name is Celso Machado. And he is a remarkable musician. I've seen him in concert a couple of times. And what's also interesting is uh, those occasions he's been solo, so he does everything himself. Guitarist, vocalist, uh, songwriter. Um, and when he performs, he also plays a lot of percussion and different instruments. And he actually uses his body in many ways. So, I mean, it's really quite something. You never miss the band with Celso Machado. So uh, this is a track from uh, a, an excellent album of his entitled Viral, uh, which is V-A-R-A-L. That's the, the, the name of the album. This piece is um, something that's it's, it's undoubtedly in Portuguese, De Pois de Anos, which I think translates into over the years or after the years. This piece is rather inside. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a bossa nova. I guess he does a lot of folkloric stuff as well. He's, he can do anything, anything in Brazil, Brazilian. Um, and this one is the most challenging harmonically. Um, so let's just call it up here and, and see what I can do with it. Uh, de Pois de Anos by Celso Machado from his album Viral. Okay. <laughs> Okay, right away you can hear the harmonies are moving in uh, subtle directions. So this is not the kind of thing where you can necessarily just find a pentatonic and uh, superimpose it and it will work everywhere. Uh, so this kind of track is a little more challenging. You might be better to stick to the soul and the R&B type material first because that tends to be harmonically simple uh, and, uh, the, the melodically simple and harmonically not too complex. This one is a little more challenging, so let's see what happens. Uh, I don't even have a chart for it. I, I looked for one and I couldn't find one. Um, so I just like the sound of it. He's a, he's a great musician. Here we go. So. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So that was um, uh, Celso Machado's um, uh, De Poix de Anos, and maybe I'll say a couple of things here about that. Um, this Brazilian in flavor, so it has its own clave. Um, I won't go into that in any great depth. Maybe I'll just say a couple of things melodically, especially on the way out. For example, the last chord, it clearly had a plus 11 in it. <laughs> So a D sharp, or I'm sorry, a D triad works over the uh, the root of C. That's the root, but if you superimpose a D major triad, you flush out that plus four, which is, that's, that's in his voicing. So it's actually a very nice sound. And the other thing that he was doing on the way out there, um, although the ch there were a lot of changes throughout the tune, and I, and I probably didn't catch all of them, but it's interesting how much I can do, is it, once again, without knowing exactly what I'm doing. Um, at the end, he was just vamping on what I clearly hear was a C uh, chord and a D flat chord, um, which is a tritone substitution. And there's certain scales that go with that. But what I want to draw your attention to, maybe just as a couple of idiomatic points, because whenever you're, you're playing, uh, you want to be mindful of the idiom you're playing. And in this, there are a couple of things that uh, I'll just mention. One is melodic. For example, um, often in this type of tune, the sixth and the ninth are very nice notes, as opposed to playing the bottom end of the chord. In addition, there's... Uh, in a, uh, the, the underlying bossa nova is samba. That's where bossa nova comes from. And the, the samba is there's a very typical pattern on the pandero. Um, and sometimes if you uh, mimic some of these rhythmic uh, features of the music, it can be kind of groovy, even if the pandero is not there. Um, so, for example, I'll just play a little bit on the way out of the tune over that. Uh, I hope I can just catch the, that vamp that he's doing which is on a C chord and a D flat chord, which is a, you know, just a tritone substitute. And I'm just going to try and emphasize the ninth and the sixth and maybe introduce some Pandero patterns. And notice how sparse and how uh, groovy it is. And it's also in keeping with the style of the piece. So we just find our way back here. Where is it? <laughs> I think he's doing now. I 
no, strangely enough, I guess I felt it coming with him. All right, so um, I know this has been somewhat discursive, um, uh, but it takes a while to get here, and I wanted to give you some idea, as I say, how to practice. Now, what I would conclude by saying is that if you're serious about improvising, as I mentioned at the outset, you must engage your ear, and the earlier you do so, the better. So what this boils down to is you should be practicing along with some recordings as part of your regular uh, practice regimen or routine. Like, I don't care what it is, uh, 10 or 15 percent, because as I say, many of you who are learning to, to improvise or just play the instrument, you have to devote a lot of time to basic groundwork. But when I was a kid, I, I tried to play with records. And I sure wasn't any good at it. I mean, I used to try and play along with Herbie Mann. I had no idea what I was doing. And it probably sounded terrible. Although there were certain things that I... And I, I, I was busy learning the instrument, too. But there's certain things I think I might have picked up. For example, a good, strong sense of rhythm. So even if I couldn't understand what was going on melodically or harmonically, I connected with the rhythm. And so I developed good time at a relatively early age. But the interesting thing is... That's how I sort of started to try and improvise was playing with records. And now, after many, many years, God knows which 10,000 hours I'm on, um, and, and a practice regimen that has evolved significantly through some of the things I've been mentioning, scales in particular, um, has evolved back to where I started. And this is how I practice now. And it's, it's all I practice. Because with this, I'm... Uh, reinforcing my ear and I'm developing my musical intuition and I'm also enabling myself to do things that I might not think about or practice because I'm responding to the music which puts me in a much uh, better state of readiness for when I actually have to perform or record with somebody and I have been in those situations not so long ago where I was supposed to have a chart and I'm dressing the track and it's not you know, a standard set of changes. And I have to just do the best I can with with my ear. Uh, I remember one situation, it was a bit tense because it, it really wasn't fair to me. I'd asked for the chart, you know, so I could have a look at, at it beforehand. Some situations are relatively straightforward and it's not a problem. Um, but thank God for my, um, uh, for cultivating my ear. So I'm saying, do the same improvisation starts with your ear um, so start introducing um, a, a measure of practicing with recordings the, the best place to start is with whatever you like the sound of whatever is relevant to you musically however for example if you're interested in jazz try to play along with a, a Charlie Parker record uh, to start that's going to be a real challenge that's why I recommend almost to anybody um, the soul and R&B music is good because it's uh, relatively simple melodically, it's not complex harmonically, and it will introduce you to a lot of the nuances that you will have to uh, uh, develop over time. And uh, uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's just a, an easier place to begin. And whatever you learn there, it's going to be relevant no matter what it is you end up focusing on. Okay, I want to keep this not too long <laughs> because everyone has a, a limited... Um, oh, geez, there's been a lot of people here. Uh, is there? I hope I didn't uh, fail to answer some questions. A lot of folks here. Sorry, I didn't move my cursor down. I see Della. I see Lisa. I see David. Uh, I, I see Rob. I see, I see a lot of my friends and some people whom I don't know personally, but I sort of know virtually. So I thank you all for uh, for Glenn and uh, Serena and um, Douglas. Yeah, a lot of folks. So I thank you all for listening. And um, I might just uh, uh, mention that for those of you who would like a little more um, specific guidance or help, I'm available for lessons. I'm very easy to find on the web at www.extremeflute.com. This is a free stream, but if you're inclined to compensate in any manner uh, whatsoever, probably the best thing is uh, just to 
buy a CD. Um, and I have eight of those out now. They're all really good. I'm very happy with all of them. Um, and they're available at Bandcamp. Um, and I also have just published a book uh, entitled The Technique and Theory of Improvisation. I actually, I've got one at the ready here. This is it, The Technique and Theory of Improvisation, which has been doing extremely well. I'm surprised uh, at how well that book has been doing. Um, it's very well organized, well presented, well written, and it tells just about everything I know. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that. And, uh, uh, and it's had really good reviews. It's been getting the response I was hoping for. And strangely enough, it has done better than any CD I have ever recorded. God knows why. I'm a performer, not an author. Um, but in any event, uh, CDs and books are things of lasting value as, as opposed to a tip jar. Mind you, tip jar never hurts either. Um, but if you'd like to take something away, that's probably a couple of the best things to take away. So I think that's it for now. Um, don't hesitate to leave any comments or suggestions you might have. Uh, maybe I'll do another. Um, but this has been a, a, an interesting exercise for me, just to disclose how I practice with a couple of, of uh, very nice tracks by uh, Canadian indie artists whom you may never have heard of. Um, and that's it for now. So thanks very much, and uh, perhaps to be continued. <laughs> Bye-bye.